Chapter 13. Railroads Regulated. Policy has been transformed into a kind of witchcraft. Darlin, 1980. 13.1. Federal Triangle. The Federal Triangle, located in Washington, D.C., just south of Pennsylvania Avenue between the Capitol and the White House, was the largest building program the U.S. government had undertaken by the time of its opening in 1934. The new buildings aimed to show the dignity and power of the nation. The Interstate Commerce Commission occupied both the apex of the Iron Triangle of regulators, the regulated, and the legislators, and one of those federal triangle buildings continuously from 1934 until its dissolution in 1995. A late 1980s visit to the impressive ICC edifice contrasts with the interior. Behind the curtain, a wall down the green narrow halls with cracked linoleum floors, visits to offices and attending an ICC hearing gave an impression of senescence. It was a sharp contrast to the impressions from the newer regulatory agencies with modern fixtures and furnishings, if not modern policies. Hence, the replacement of the ICC by the Surface Transportation Board, housed elsewhere, came as little surprise. Its old and run-down furnishings and fixtures symbolized its old and run-down ideas. Like the ICC that regulated them, most of today's transport systems are mature, or nearly so. They are fully deployed, structures are fixed and inflexible, and the mix and variety of the services that can be offered are limited. Given that situation, how do systems respond to changes in their environments? We explore that question using the U.S. railroads as a case in point. Using our life cycle scheme, we are in the maturity phase of the cycle and matters we treat generalize very well to the situation across the board in transport today. It's fair to say that in the more developed nations, most systems are nearly or fully developed and services available everywhere. Designs are fixed, unitary technologies are used, So while we are looking at the rail system, we see behavior problems and reactions to problems common across today's systems. In the early days, as discussed in the UK context, the government role was largely enabling, chartering firms and so on, and by default, doing things in the interest of the railroads that, for one reason or another, the railroads couldn't build a consensus for action. For example, board of trade intervention when railroads couldn't agree on running rights. Tasks similar to these carried forward into the near and full deployment phase of development, the phase now examined. The government role was broadened and fine-tuned. In addition to this already established role, we will see some other roles emerge. In general, we can say these emerged because the bloom was no longer on the rose. During the startup and expansion phase, new services were being made available and existing services improved. Improvements tend to stagnate as the unitary technology is locked in and service becomes widely available. At this point, the debate over who claims the transport rents become fiercer. Absence improvement, ills are more visible, and problems covered up by improvements emerge for management. In response, we see a wave of tightening regulation, with regulation steered in many ways by the who gets the rents question. We also see a notion of rationalization emerge and be modified and modified. The rationalization story is treated in Chapter 21. This chapter focuses on the emergence and maturity of modal regulation. Correspondence in the Locus of Authority Medieval society ran on the common will. Later, as commerce extended village to village, shops and inns and larger enterprises were subjected to medieval common law attitudes. Shopkeepers and others derived their rights and powers from the community, and communities specified the terms of services and prices charged. For example, inns charged fair rates. They could not refuse service without good reason. Communities developing in the United States were clothed in that spirit. The villages and towns continued to control the activities within them. In addition to stating the terms in which individual entrepreneurs operated within their span of control, these communities undertook public works to serve the members of the community. But railroads and canals were big enterprises, and they were more than villages and towns could handle from the standpoints of financing and geographic scope of activities. Extending the medieval tradition, rail and canal organizations were chartered by the states to serve the public. Essential elements of those charters were the notions that service to the public was to be without discrimination and favoritism. Users in like circumstances were to be served the same, and government was entitled to regulate rates, terms of service, quality of service, and so on. Government delegated authority necessary to the purposes of corporations. For example, the power of claiming eminent domains over property was delegated to the railroads. In the early 1800s, public attitudes drifted from medieval logic. The spirit of Adam Smith and laissez-faire gripped the nation. Actually, the spirit was behind many early settlements. They were commercial enterprises with certain rights and restrictions. The Virginia Company and the Massachusetts Bay Company were examples. 
These enterprises are also worth comparing with the chartered trading companies of the same era, discussed in section 5.2. Small farmers, merchants, and larger organizations began to do what they wanted to do. There had been a breakdown of the medieval village, and at any rate, many new activities were non-traditional and also did not fit traditional governing units. The nation was growing very rapidly. Most people shared in that growth, and laissez-faire was seen as a touchstone for growth. The within railroad and between railroad embedded policies and rules explain much about their structure and behavior. A similar statement holds for all transportation systems. However, governments were asked to develop policies when the railroads could not develop and enforce needed embedded policies. One case is when the domain of the policy extends beyond the domain of the mode. For example, policies needed to assist in acquiring right of way. Another case is when there are winners and losers within the modal community and governments are asked to play the referee. The granting of track rights and criteria for the division of income from movements involving more than one firm are examples. This ad hoc development of government policy seems especially true during the early days of systems. Such policies aim to help the system get deployed and work. Later on, government policies respond more to broad social consensus about systems. They intend to control the system for social purposes. Regulatory acts and institutional and administrative actions relative to freight tariffs and passenger service occurred in Britain in 1868, 1873, and 1893. Those initiatives and U.S. federal initiatives of the late 1800s involved values, ideas, and concepts that were commonplace then and remain so today in the verbiage of common law. Yet the imposition of those ideas on the railroad turned the clock back. There was a reference to a mismatch government structures, and we have used some ideas about that to aid in recognizing issues and policy responses as shown in the table. Using that classification device, issues may be divided into two classes, on and off diagonal. The problems of dealing with off diagonal issues are much discussed in the literature, especially by persons engaged in intergovernmental relations. The table and its implications are transparent and will not be further remarked on at this point. Just as with spatial correspondence problems discussed above, there are things which are political, subject to planning processes, that sometimes fall to the technicals, engineers, to decide. Things which are technical sometimes fall to the politicals to decide. These mismatches are the cause of major resource misallocations. We can frame this as in this table. Things which are on the diagonal might include technical authority and technical issues, such as striping of roadways, or political issues with political authority, such as the allocation of tax revenue. But we can see some mismatches. The original interstate highway system was laid out by engineers, but had an obvious political set of issues that were initially decided only within the technicals value system. This led to conflict. The ICC used political decision-making to set prices in potentially competitive markets. Today, we have political interference in what ought to be routine political decisions, like highway maintenance on existing facilities, where the objectives and values are not seriously questioned. Thirteen point three: Mighty Elevators of Grain. The social mood of the Gilded Age was that the public and individual interest was very much served by entrepreneurial freedom. The railroads, in some measures, were providing better and better services, so the public should have been pleased by current service compared to previous, and have expectations for even better service in the future. But there were problems straining the social contract, as described in Section 13.4. So although the terms of reference in which the federal government exercised control over the railroads seem very familiar today, Federal control was a turning of the clock back from laissez-faire so far as the evolution of the economy and the roles of individuals and corporations within it were concerned. Government began to exercise its traditional medieval rights in a manner that had not been exercised visibly and strongly for some decades, if not centuries. The states attempted to manage by extending general laws so that they dealt with specific ills and by development of commissions, some advisory, some regulatory, to make the laws work. Although individually owned, the grain elevators colluded in the setting of prices, and they controlled the movement of grain from much of the Midwest to markets in the East. In 1873, the state of Illinois passed a Warehouse Act to regulate the rates and terms of service in Chicago's grain elevators. This act was challenged by successors to the firm of Ira Munn and George Scott, whose elevator business failed during the Panic of 1873, in part because of corruption. Munn v. Illinois, 1877, worked its way up to the United States Supreme Court, Citing common law, the Supreme Court, in a decision by Chief Justice Morrison Waite, found that the activities of the grain elevators were a matter of great public consequence. He wrote, 
Common carriers exercise a sort of public office and have duties to perform in which the public is interested. Their business is therefore affected with the public interest. Countering the claim that the law destroyed private property, Waite argued that legislators elected by the people were the appropriate form to establish regulation and the courts should behave with self-restraint in the economic arena. Thus, Illinois had a clear right to regulate those grain elevators in the public interest. Munn versus Illinois was a precedent-setting case, and it applied clearly to the railroads. This enabled the states to regulate the railroads in federal regulation of interstate commerce. Reasoning from Munn v. Illinois, findings in Wabash, St. Louis, and Pacific Railroad versus Illinois, established the right of Congress to regulate interstate commerce. The state actions were, however, ineffective, and debates escalated to the federal level. In 1872, President Grant appointed the Wyndham Committee to look into the matter. It recommended government ownership of railroads. However, legislation failed into the McCollum Report, which led to the Act to Regulate Commerce of 1887, recommended an Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate rates. The Act was not much more than an appeal to common law, and it lacked enforcement means. Its first three parts required rates to be just and reasonable, forbade personal discrimination and rebates, and outlawed undue or unreasonable preferences. All of this is very much in common law tradition. Other requirements limited long haul and short haul rates, prohibited pooling arrangements and publication of rates, and fares was required as well as due notice of increases. The long haul and short haul limitations referred to equality of rates under substantially similar circumstances. All of the phraseology rolls smoothly on the tongue. We nod in agreement that is how actors are supposed to behave. But the act served up general prescriptions, and it was not exactly clear how the Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, was to implement common law prescriptions. After all, ICC was a small new organization created to regulate a vast enterprise when communications, office record keeping, availability of skilled bureaucrats, and other attributes that are commonplace today were not available. The Interstate Commerce Act, more than anything else, strengthened the license of individuals and organizations to ask the courts to make decisions about the activities of railroads. However, this was unworkable due to the tremendous volume of case law involved. Moreover, it resulted in individual courts deciding on matters of preference, reasonable treatment, and other such factors that require guidelines and comparisons. The courts would not expedite injunctions to enforce ICC orders. They took testimony and acted on their own. They limited ICC control over just and reasonable rates, and they interpreted the phrase substantially similar circumstances and conditions in quite a literal manner. Rebating continued. Congress seemed satisfied with the situation for about a decade and a half and then moved to strengthen the ICC. The Elkins Act of 1903 amended the 1887 Act and limited rebates. Congress corrected this problem in the Hepburn Act of 1906, which removed the courts from the critical path. The Act further extended jurisdiction of ICC regulation to sleeping car companies, express companies, pipelines, and railroad terminals. It prohibited free railroad passes, permitted specification of maximum rates, and prescription of through and joint rates, forbade the railroads hauling goods except lumber they produced, and put commission orders into effect in 30 days without prior approval of the courts. Finally, the Mann-Elkins Act of 1910 reformatted the long and short haul clause by deleting a substantially similar phrasing and extended ICC rule to telephone, telegraph, and cable companies, later to be regulated by the Federal Communications Commission. Though there were additional acts affecting the ICC, the ICC as we have known it during the decades of the present century was mainly shaped by the Hepburn Act. To make a long story short, we may observe that laying down fair rules of behavior and giving the ICC enough clout to enforce them solved the problem of planning for the operations of railroads. The legislation discussed above deals mainly with rate discrimination. The predatory behavior of firms, stock watering, traffic pooling, and monopoly practices were somewhat slower in being managed and began to be treated under antitrust law rather than ICC law. Acts eventually tempered that treatment, while the ICC gained control over security issues and bankruptcy proceedings, and the reed Bullwinkle Act circumvented the effect of antitrust on rate bearers. The above discussion doesn't begin to list all the details of legislation, but it is enough to identify trends and major matters at issue, especially rates. Because of the very large number of things carried, commodities were grouped into classes and rates developed for classes. On account of fixed terminal costs, these rates incorporated a tapering distance scale. This convention did not hold for intercity passenger rates. Rates reflected what the traffic would bear and also considered a weight volume relationship. Actually, comparatively little traffic moved under class rates. Most moved under commodity rates, which were specific to commodities and points of origin and destination. 
Nonetheless, the rate class concepts were reflected in commodity rates. The Transportation Act of 1920 emphasized the responsibility of government to assure that adequate transportation was provided, very much a change of mood. These are important words. They stress the positivism of governments. It is a notion that has reappeared in bits and pieces of legislative rhetoric at all levels of government, yet that positive role in strengthening activities is not in the present rail debate. It is a get-the-government-out-of-the-way debate. Thirteen point four government's proactive normative rule an issue often arises when it is recognized that some activity is dysfunctional something isn't working correctly. One litmus test for dysfunctional activities is the logic of what governments do among other things, governments are expected to manage things that are regarded as wrong. If something is going on that counters the way governments are supposed to manage things, there is an issue. The logic of what governments do has grown out of long experiences. Transport roles in the U.S. are seen for governments when there are constitution-based responsibilities. The economic integration of the states, interstate trade, safety, health, and the provision of services, welfare. The presence of market failure, limits on expertise, control of illegal activities, non-transport goals affecting transportation, and many other considerations over the years have broadened the bases from which roles are argued. We have attempted to make a list of the reasons why governments have regulated or nationalized transport systems. Fairness. Service is not available everywhere. Small and large customers or shippers are not treated in the same way. Gains from trade should be split differently between service providers and service users. Transportation or location rents ought to be shared between capital and labor. Monopsony customers and competition mean not all providers make adequate profits. Competition. Dysfunctional market organization is a market failure needing repair. Monopoly transportation providers abuse their economic power. Natural monopolies cannot recover high fixed costs. Progress. Infant industry industries need assistance. A variation on this is the notion that social overhead capital requires upfront investment. Process of innovation and technology development are not working in viable ways. Productivity is falling or improvements are diminishing off system and on system. Technology change begs new arrangements. Stability. Control of between or within system competition is necessary in order to achieve some desired result. Stability is a good thing, but transport development or deterioration may upset an existing equilibrium. A social contract begins to fail. The value of capital stock to the value of the plant that varies widely. Off system. Transportation may need to be limited, expanded, or coordinated to achieve some off system goal. The health and safety of the public must be ensured. The health and safety of labor must be ensured. Effective workings of government, national economic systems, or defense systems must be ensured. The list of rationales is rough and we would not argue it's perfection. Indeed, each time we use it, we think of needed revisions. The point of the list is that it helps identify the nature of issues and their origins. As we see it, an issue arises when something is wrong. Wrong with respect to what? Rail or air service to small communities is seen as a fairness issue, for example. The railroads or airlines are not providing services to all. 13.5. Regulating Labor Relations Stakeholders in transportation enterprises include users, owners, managers, and labor. And the labor part of the equation is big. About one of every nine employed persons in the U.S. is employed in transportation or in a transportation-related activity such as gasoline service stations. Even so, one finds little explicit consideration of labor interests in the academic literature on policy. Transit labor inputs are an exception. Labor has its own special iron triangles. Why is labor treated apart from general debates? Labor organizations evolved with modern factory and transportation systems. Prior to modern production and transportation, there were artisan labor organizations, guilds, and the organizational basis shifted from things produced to workplaces. Early organizational purposes included social and retirement arrangements, but soon extended to the notion that labor could organize to sell its product, labor, to the workplace. That notion, however, was in direct conflict with common law. Labor was seen as conspiring to take the property of others, and court-made law said that conspiring to strike was the taking of the rights of owners to use labor as they wished. Work at home can be compared with a factory, work out of home systems, basically as trade-offs in scale economies and transport costs. To the extent that scale economies are less achieved with people commuting out of the house because manufacturing requires less and less labor, shopping can be more effectively conducted virtually rather than in store.
and telecommunications become better and better substitutes for in-person contact, we should expect the substitution to become the more dominant feature of the relationship between transportation and communication. That situation held until 1842, when Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts broke the conspiracy theory, holding that labor organizations may exist for public-spirited purposes. That was a means-end doctrine. The end was lawful, therefore the means were lawful. The case had to do with the refusal of union workers to work for employers using non-union employees. Means had to be mild. Workers could resign and thus not work, but they could not take actions to prevent owners from operating their businesses. Beginning in the 1870s, injunctions prohibited picketing, boycotts, and trespassing. That situation holds today, though the notion of appropriate means has been vastly softened. The railroads were big businesses, and during the period we are discussing were the stage for much of labor strife. Coal mines, steel mills, and packing plants were the other large stages. Two, they attracted national attention because of the wide effects of labor disruptions. Carrying forward the guild tradition somewhat, rail labor was organized into craft unions, which reduced its effectiveness because of the indifference of other unions to a craft union's special interest. There was common interest when railroads asked for across-the-board pay reductions and in other common interest cases. But when strikes occurred, injunctions stopped them. Unions had other problems. For instance, Eugene Debs and other radical union organizers found little support for their view in the general population. The perceived and real abuses by big business resulted in the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Every contract combination or conspiracy in the restraint of trade or commerce among the several states is illegal. Although unexpected by the drafter of the legislation, the act was quickly used against unions. For years, indeed, its main use was against unions. Strikes and strife continued, even so. The result was the ineffective Erdman Act of 1898 and the more effective Newlands Act of 1913, providing for arbitration panels. By this time, the stage was national, for the railroads grouped and worked together, as did labor. But arbitration doesn't always work. The Newlands Act foundered on labor's desire to change the dual rate of pay from 10 hours or 100 miles, whichever came first, to 8 hours or 100 miles. Labor refused arbitration, and to avoid a crisis on the eve of World War I, the Congress passed the Adamson Act of 1916 granting labor's demand. The matter was again arbitrated, and in 1985 the 100-mile component was raised by 2 miles per year, so in 1988, 108 miles was the rule. In 1917, President Wilson seized the railroad, citing ineffective operations and labor difficulties. They remained in government control for 26 months until March 1, 1920. Rail wages doubled during this period. The broadly important matter, however, was that government abruptly shifted from an adversary of organized labor to a supporter. It sought legislation to encourage union membership and to take labor relations out of the courts and to avoid injunction process. A series of acts followed. The Transportation Act of 1920 the Rail Labor Act of 1926, and the Rail Labor Act of 1934 set up special provisions for dealing with the railroads and the airlines in 1934. A parallel set of acts, and in particular the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, extended to labor generally. These acts state the right to organize and bargain collectively without interference from employers. In the rail and air cases, it is the duty of all carriers and employees to exert every reasonable effort to voluntarily settle disputes. For major disputes, the Rail Air National Mediation Board establishes an arbitration board with subpoena power over persons and documents. Awards are enforceable through the courts. If that process doesn't work, then the National Mediation Board notifies the president who can establish an emergency board. Once the board is appointed, parties must hold the status quo while data are gathered and for 30 days after a finding is made. Findings have only the force of the status of the president in public opinion. If the findings are not accepted, then the president may ask Congress for special legislation. So today, major issues are settled by the Congress. The carriers are very unhappy about this, for labor often has more power in Congress than carriers do. Our question is about the ways labor considerations enter the policy debate. We said that labor considerations are a thing aside. Labor is a thing aside because it has its own story and traditions. There are explicit processes for labor considerations that are distinctive. Legislative and administrative consideration and the trail of law for labor questions are apart from those used in policy generally. We made one not very surprising finding. The railroad experience had general spin-offs. As a large early stage railroad problem resolution served as a model for other activities, much of labor law is based on the labor precedents. Why, from a labor perspective, are airlines treated as railroads? Mainly we see that as an accident of timing. 
airlines were beginning to be regulated at a time when there were major revisions in rail labor legislation. Unlike interstate trucking, the airlines were regulated prior to the development of general labor law. Thirteen point six deregulation. Jumping to the railroad situation in the last two decades of the 20th century, there were new ideas floating around with the return to laissez-faire conditions via deregulation carrying the day. One reason for the deregulation thrust was the ICC's debilitating impact on the viability of the railroads. It has been said, and it is no doubt true, that regulation costs the nation a great deal in efficiency terms. Without regulation, the railroads would act more wisely, obtain efficiencies, and the nation would be better off. In general, it is accepted that competition is a good thing. It was necessary to regulate the railroads at one time because they were monopolies. Also, conditions of entry were such that no reasonable organization would enter the market, even if the actor already there misbehaved, the critical factor being the large investment in fixed plant required in order to enter the market. A related matter was that fixed costs were relatively high, so marginal costs decreased over the range of outputs feasible in markets. This phenomenon blocked marginal cost pricing guides, as well as the ability of competitive actors to enter the market. The deregulation argument is that much has changed. In particular, trucks offered competition to rail and barges and pipelines under certain circumstances. No actor can misbehave for long. The extent to which that is true has bothered Congress, and the ICC examined the question of captive shippers and found a, new, a few of them. It required that railroads make the contents of contracts public. Thinking about the impact of the ICC on the industry involved what we may call the internal dynamic of a bureaucratic agency. Political scientists and students of organizations have written a variety of things on this. One way to summarize is to say that agencies go through a life cycle. They start out by having trouble getting their feet on the ground and learning how to walk. Then they walk with great vigor, and finally they fall into fixed patterns of behavior and stasis. That notion fits the ICC and other regulatory agencies very well, and it is fair to say that in the last decades the agency had a certain rigor mortis. A companion factor is that the agencies become captives of those who they regulate. That was the case for the ICC. It generally acquiesced to what the railroads wanted to do. Beyond requiring hearings and publications, it did not regulate rates much at all. Another observation stems from an interpretation of what the railroads collectively wanted to do. There is common denominator interpretation of what the railroads wanted to do. For instance, if a railroad wanted to do something very aggressive and other railroads didn't agree, the aggressive railroad would be stifled. This was especially the case in merger policy where third-party railroads would be very demanding. Deregulation is aimed at avoiding such least common denominator actions. The debate over deregulation concerned the stifling impact of a bureaucracy and the advantages of competitive behavior. The latter was enabled by arguments such that the non-existence of monopolies because of truck competition or the potential for service by competitors. Notice that this debate is in essence quite different from the one in the late 1800s, which had more to do with how organizations should act under the rules of common law and the notion that big important things are clothed in the public interest. The second observation is that the debate in the ICC arena was limited to mergers, rates, and terms of service. It overlooks the presence of much regulation elsewhere in government and in organizations created by the railroads themselves, rate bureaus and the Association of American Railroads standards setting in particular, as well as by organizations such as the National Industrial Transportation League formed in 1907 to serve shippers before the ICC, but since deregulation has sought a broader role serving carriers as well. Rate bureaus are no more. Rate bureaus never told the railroads what to do anyway. They were a communications medium and a consensus building arena. By and large, the return on investment in railroads has never been very great. Many railroads were in trouble before the ICC was created before 1887, during the period when the ICC gathered some strength, 1877 to 1915, and later. Much of the economic literature on rail costs and deregulation largely justified moving toward a deregulated system. The ICC was replaced by the Surface Transportation Board in 1995 after steadily losing importance due to the deregulation promoted by the Staggers Rail Act and Motor Carrier Act, both passed in 1980. The most recent data suggest that significant productivity increases in rail in the 1980s post-deregulation and in aviation in the 2000s post-bankruptcy and reorganization. The post office and long-distance trucking have seen only modest gains. Thirteen point seven comparisons of the developed world. Sometimes when you have everything, you can't really tell what matters. Christina Onassis.
Striving to summarize the English, French, and U.S. policy experiences and anticipate the developing world's future experiences, some broad brush remarks were made. With the exception of France, experiences similar to those discussed for England held on the continent. Early on, France differed because of its strong central government, its traditions on scientific work, rationalization, and professionalism. We think of the term entrepreneurial capitalism best captures English policy. English policy had a hands-off character, and this seems to have flowed from the notion that the national interest was best served by competitive independent firms creating jobs and wealth. Rate setting by agreements among firms, rates high enough to return profits, and so on, resulted in profitable firms. It was a bit of welfare tempering, for example, workmen's trains, publication of rates, and listing of charges, but not much. Also, Parliament's careful examination of requests for charters protected property owners, existing properties, and investors from poorly developed schemes. The French policy experience may be labeled absolutism or statism. All decisions turned on what was taken to be good for the state and were made by the state. Plans were made by the state instead of by firms, as in England. The same was true of tariffs, rates, fares. There was state financing, partial, instead of private capital. Operations had heavy state input. It was to be eventual state ownership of facilities. The U.S. policy doesn't summarize so easily. Early on, local and state mercantilism makes a good label, and there's also flirtation with aspects of federal absolutism, when railroads linking the West Coast with the Midwest were debated, and when regulation was considered. After some bad experiences, policy evolved into what may be termed a U.S. version of entrepreneurial capitalism, capitalism constrained by antitrust and rail-specific regulation. That continues even though the Interstate Commerce Commission had been eliminated. Let's call it constrained entrepreneurial capitalism. An example may aid in contrasting the differing national approaches to policy. Early on, trains had no brakes, and as trains became larger, faster, and heavier, hand-applied mechanical brakes began to be used. However, poor braking was the cause of many accidents. Late in the 1800s, George Westinghouse developed the air brake. The French adopted it by fiat. Use it. The French took the attitude that when the property saw that air brakes made good sense, they would adopt them. No government action was needed. Indeed, the English had a hands-off policy on safety generally. They were government inspectors that reviewed properties and their reports were published, but government took no action beyond that. The U.S. government negotiated with the rail properties and adopted a legislative requirement for air brakes, but the refinement and implementation of air brakes was pretty much left to the railroads and their decision-making arrangements. We think of the summary just given as broad brush. We would be remiss not to point out even broader brush thoughts. Each national rail policy experience was rooted in situational attributes, as well as the ideas and attitudes that influenced the thinking about related governmental organizations and roles. All that can be termed political, national, ethic, or culture. That's the kind of thing Alexis de Tocqueville commented so skillfully on in his Democracy in America and in his The Old Regime and the French Revolution. As stated, the rail experience provides a mother logic for policy in other modes. We need to go beyond that to point out that rail mother logic was shaped by national culture. It was a, also a shaper of national culture, especially in the United States. In this respect, a very broad brush view of rail policy provides a comment on national industrial policy. Note that the labels we have attached to English, French, and U.S. rail policy apply to industrial policy in general. The French have elected to develop key industries. The British and the Americans have had rather different industrial policies. Other countries, including the less developed ones, fall here or there between the extremes of absolutism and entrepreneurial capitalism. Earlier, we said that all nations are developed given historic paths, resources, tools, and other attributes. We now invert that statement, for if we accept that change in transportation is possible, the new futures are available to all nations. In some ways, the transportation development problem is most urgent in the so-called developed nations. The old systems have clearly run their course, and that's one reason for the slowdown in development and lack of investment opportunities. But there are other urgent development objectives, many of a reduced constraints type, reduce government regulation, limit the number of product liability cases. Some objectives call for investments such as in new technology and education. That is, there are a lot of urgent things to do that are more visible and closer than transportation to the mainstream of economic and political thought. Wilfred Owen, a longtime student of economic development, now gives overriding attention to equity. He says that with all less developed nations should be prepared with upgraded road systems. Without such systems, residents cannot participate in modern life, acquire health services, and so forth. Leaving aside the point that roads are not enough, Owen has an attractive thought. 
a basic level of transport service may be a prerequisite to the rest of civilization. Compared to other nations, the existing transport systems of the United States are regarded as in pretty good shape, despite congestion and some disrepair. Thirteen point eight iron triangles and aluminum rectangles. The act to regulate commerce goes into effect on Tuesday next. The National Commission is now in session. The railways, as well as the public generally, will give them every encouragement possible for the execution of their duties. The Railway Age, April 1887. In the United States, the national government structure comprises three branches, the legislature, Congress, the executive, the president and administrators, and the judiciary, the courts. Informed by the executive and in other ways, Congress makes policy. Policy implementation takes place within the independent regulatory agencies or executive branch departments. The courts interpret the intent of Congress, the relations among the branches of government and government powers. That's the balance of powers and triad that civics textbooks show. Actually, policy is made by a different triad. There is negotiation between those who are affected and those who affect. The playground for the formation and implementation of transport policy are regulatory agencies or units of departments, a subcommittee of the Congress, and those who are regulated, for example, the railroads. The structure is so tight that the expression iron triangle has been used to describe it. it is a government within and partly outside government. The ICC was imposed in a fashion satisfactory to interested publics, the stockholders of railroads, railroad management and labor, shippers, the states, and so on. The conventional view for the origin of the ICC is that the actors in the so-called Granger states coalesced politically around an effort to achieve fairness of treatment from railroads. There were conflicts between the states and the federal government as well as the differing regional interests in the Granger era. But there is the opposite view. The railroads wanted to stabilize their environments and dampen competition, which may explain why the railroads seem to welcome regulation, as noted in this chapter's opening quote. This iron triangle substructure provides the context for many studies of the interrelations of structure and behavior. That model of a tight substructure described well the situation in previous decades for the trucking, maritime, air, intercity bus, and rail modes. However, now things are a little fuzzier. That is partly because the United States Department of Transportation, USDOT, has gained strength and has begun to advocate policy. Also, the USDOT has picked up safety regulation tasks, though the situation differs by mode. Moreover, independent environmental and consumer groups now keep a closer tab on transport policy and try to influence, moving us from an iron triangle to what we might call an aluminum rectangle. As more players involve themselves in transport policy, the rigid policy structure becomes far less rigid. This has become most pronounced in highway and transit policy since the 1991 Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, which opened up transport policy making to many more players. The Federal Highway Administration FHWA has worked hard to define its turf, and it works hard to keep and expand what it has. Although the FHWA is only one component of the truck highway user system, and it must adhere to system rules, it can take considerable independent action. It is a powerful creator and implementer of policy. On the matter of turf, the Surface Transportation Board, STB, has no difficulty interrelating with railroad fixed facility topics, such as route abandonment. It has not said a word about the FHWA's debate with truckers over facilities suitable for large trucks. It would not dare to, for highways are not part of the STB turf. The FHWA in the truck situation is an example of an iron triangle. Few outside groups have involved themselves effectively in truck regulation, causing this to keep only three corners. Other cases include the Army Corps of Engineers and its waterways and wetlands, and the Federal Aviation Administration and its airways and airport systems. The Federal Transit Administration situation is a bit different because of scale. Transit regulation triangles historically have been local ones, with local public utility commissions or similar agencies having regulatory functions. Recent changes have reduced the strength of these arrangements and have created national sets of relations. One trend in the United States has increased interest of the DOT in policymaking and implementation. The DOT and OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, more and more exert their influence on policy and regulation and varying results. The DOT had considerable influence in the Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, de facto deregulation of the railroads. Structure plays out differently in other nations, of course. Even so, other nations usually have a regulatory organization and special interest groups, such as highway lobbies, have their say. In some, 
There is the white paper style of policy analysis. In many other nations, systems are or were nationalized, especially railroads. The Iron Triangle concept doesn't have the inside government, outside government split found in the United States. That is, government is regulating inside government railroads. There is more government versus those who are governed conflict in the United States than in the nationalized system case. It would be hard to show that there is. Thirteen point nine discussion. Although rail construction continued into the 1900s, the fabric of rail networks was pretty much deployed in the United States and Western Europe by the last third of the 1800s. At this juncture, a series of problems became more visible, and there is a striking parallel between those problems and the ones commonly listed for today's transportation problems. Management of the system became the priority. That is, interest shifted from planning construction tactics to planning control operations and a little attention was given to planning technology, strategy, which was largely thought too late to shift. Government control was imposed to manage the fiscal problems of the properties and assure their fair treatment, that is, by other roads and large shippers, obtain fair treatment of individual users, large or small, stabilize the competitive position of regions, and rationalize investment and disinvestment. Many would use the term regulation to characterize ICC activities. We think it is useful to see regulation as the outcome of a style of planning. The goal was to maintain a viable physical system. The concentration was on soft instruments rather than investment. Regulation was innovated. It was trial and error, especially with respect to needed legislation. Things that worked were adopted. The building blocks of the times were used. Such building blocks included the rules tradition, then accounting systems, legal styles of inquiry and management, and the rate-making agencies of the roads. The ICC agency culture and style resulted, a culture and style that was imitated as government began to regulate in other areas. That's one result of railroad regulation. It taught governments how to regulate. What were other results? It took a while, but regulation did repair most of the tears in the social contract. With respect to the embedded policy problems the railroads could not solve, regulation enforced rate and service agreements and stabilized competitive relationships. It protected weak roads from the strong. Stabilization is perhaps a key word. Mergers and purchases were slowed down and price changes were tempered. At least to some extent, management became concerned with regulation rather than efficiency, and innovation suffered in some respects. Changes that would have occurred in a more open situation were slowed down. The resulting lack of responsiveness began to be seen as a problem in the 1920s, and acute problem was recognized as other modes, especially truck, inland water, and pipelines began to compete. The solution to that problem was to rationalize the situation. Before leaving this topic, we should point out that government regulation was hardly a standoff, except for the public interest matter. This was especially true after ills in the social contract were repaired. Section 13.8 introduced the notion of the Iron Triangle. Regulatory agencies get co-opted by the organizations they are to regulate. The Ralph Nader study groups, the Interstate Commerce Commission, put that in harsher terms. Quote, the ICC and the transport industries forged a corporate state that utilized public power for corporate purposes. The chapter began by looking back in time, looking all the way back to medieval society in order to interpret the regulation of the railroads in the late 1800s. Before regulation, laissez-faire ruled, but laissez-faire behavior sowed the seeds of regulation. Regulation controlled the behavior of railroads and brought them in line with common law norms. However, just as free market excesses create the rationale for regulation, regulatory excesses of the ICC type build in their own destruction. There is a life cycle. In the early days, political interest is high and young professionals have the political power and energy to aggressively pursue regulatory tasks. But regulators age, the low cost, big payoff things get done, and political interest and power decrease and agency culture and procedures harden. Special interest groups can exert more and more power as others pay less attention. Agencies become a liability to a democratic government and are at risk of death.